Okay, hello my friends. Here are seven big stories for today. And North Korea is still the top story. It's bizarre. Let's talk about this. Here's the ISW. North Korea and Russia signed an agreement on October 30th to cooperate in the sphere of digital communication. So this is a, a subsequent agreement. The latest development in Russian-North Korean cooperation likely aimed at enhancing the Kremlin's digital authoritarianism, tools to increase domestic repression. So I'm not sure who's learning from whom here in this uh, arrangement, but uh, they're getting cozier and that's not good. Okay, the U.S. says 8,000 North Korean troops are positioned in Russia's Kursk Oblast. Now, a few days ago, it was just 3,000. The total was going to be 10, 11, maybe 12,000, but 3,000 had already landed wherever they were going, and now it's up to 8,000. North Korean soldiers in Russian uniforms are preparing for frontline combat operations in Ukraine, according to the Secretary of State. Um, more about North Korea. South Korea is not happy about that. South Korea plans to send a monitoring team to Ukraine amid North Korean troop presence. This was just out in the Euromaidan press today. Officials stated Seoul has a, quote, legitimate need, unquote, to analyze North Korean military activities in the war in Ukraine and feels the need to establish a monitoring team. So I'm sure they'll be welcomed in helping the Ukrainians try to figure out what's going on with the North Koreans. Meanwhile, North Korea says that they will stand by Russia until Moscow's victory in Ukraine. This is the North Korean foreign minister, Cho Soon Hui, said in Moscow, according to AFP. And that was, again, just today. North Korea accuses the U.S. of nuclear conspiracies. Sure, it's the U.S. trying to nuke North Korea. Against it, citing recent deployments of U.S. aircraft carriers, strategic submarines, nuclear-capable bombers around the Korean peninsula. The foreign minister relayed a message that North Korea will continue to strengthen its nuclear capabilities to counter the perceived Western threats against both Pyongyang and its ally Russia. So, Again, they're getting cozier and cozier and cozier. Meanwhile, Zelensky's frustrated, and I understand his frustration. He says, this is nothing, zero. Now, what's he talking about? He's slamming the Western response to North Korean troop deployment. It's like they got crickets for that. Here it is in the Euro, uh, not, sorry, the Kiev Post, not Euromaidan Press. Uh, and if there is nothing, and I think the reaction to this is nothing, says Zelensky, it has been zero, then the number of North Korean troops on our border will be increased. I think that's a fair assessment. I think that's probably exactly what's going to happen. The West has said that they find this alarming, but nothing else. They've not actually done anything about it. Meanwhile, North Korea was testing this missile uh, and that it shot toward Japan. North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile test records the longest ever flight time. Well, how did it do that? Because it only went to about Japan. One of my viewers pointed this out, and that's what made me look for this. So thank you uh, for that. You know who you are. Like the the height, the range of the missile. So North Korea conducted a test launch of its intercontinental ballistic missile ICBM on Thursday morning local time with a breakthrough flight duration of 87 minutes. How'd it go so long between Korea and Japan? That's not that far. The Japanese government said that the missile flew an almost vertical lofted trajectory, reached an altitude of 7,000 kilometers or 4,349 miles. That went up 4,000 miles. And like that's into space. Like that's that's something pretty significant, right? The flight time was the longest ever, possibly a, the newest missile ever, Japanese minister uh, said, uh, adding that the missile landed in the waters about 300 kilometers, 190 miles west of Japan's islands. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, if you look into uh, how ballistic missiles work, they go up very high and then they come down. But this went about double what it's, well, not quite double, but a long ways, maybe time and a half, almost double. In order to cover lar large distances, ballistic missiles are usually launched into a suborbital space flight for intercontinental missiles. The highest altitude reached during free flight is about 4,500 kilometers, and this went seven thousand kilometers. So it, it was somewhat of an achievement for the North Koreans to do this, but what are they doing? Are they trying to get into space or are they try, trying to set a record or what? We're not exactly sure, but you haven't heard the West say anything about it and that's the troubling part. All right. Meanwhile, Poland has started construction of the Eastern Shield on the border with Belarus and Russia. 
This is according to Prime Minister Donald Tusk. The Eastern Shield involves the construction of fortifications, barriers, and military facilities on NATO's eastern borders. It'll be 700 kilometers long. It will cost nearly $2.5 billion, and it's scheduled to be completed by 2028. The government intends to create a comprehensive defense infrastructure on NATO's eastern flank to counter threats from both Belarus and Russia. So Poland's worried about it. Lithuania's worried about it. Uh, uh, Estonia is worried about it. I think I saw something about Latvia doing something along these lines. Like, they're all concerned. And who are they concerned about? It's all about Russia. So now it's past time that we grant Poland's request to shoot down Russian missiles over Ukraine. And this came from the chairman and co-chairman or the ranking member of a committee in Congress, the Republican and the Democrat, both. And uh, here, despite Russia's continued escalation throughout hybrid warfare, airspace violations, attacks on critical infrastructure, efforts to destabilize democratic institutions, we have hesitated to confront these threats decisively, allowing Russia to wage a war against the alliance with minimal consequences. Spot on. That's right. Russia is get, learning the lesson that we just keep pushing the West, they won't do anything. And that's a horrible lesson for them to learn. Jane Keefe said, imagine if the U.S. allowed Ukraine to have 586 Heimers like Poland has. How fast the war would have been over. Why is he saying that? Well, Poland is planning to buy more than 100 more U.S. MLRS Heimers to the previous 486 that they have already ordered. Like Poland's hardcore and they're providing weapons that are going to help end the war more quickly. Okay, switching gears, General Ben Hodges says this only stops when Russia is defeated. Anything short of this means a continuation of Russian aggression. And China's watching to see if we'll have the will to stop Russia. Now he's reacting to this here, and this is the permanent representative of Russia to the United Nations. And he's laying out his case, which is one, no Minsk agreements, no freeze into the war, two, no Ukraine in NATO, three, mandatory demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. So take all their weapons away so they can't fight back in the future. And four, all the goals of the special military operation will be achieved. Okay. So they're not trying to concede anything or trying to work toward a peace plan or anything like that. Meanwhile, Lavrov. Lavrov is going to visit the European Union for the first time since the beginning of the war. Lavrov's going to Malta in December to take part in the OSCE, Foreign Minister's Council. Now, do you know what the OSCE is? That's the fascinating thing. Look at this. With 57 participating states in Europe, Asia, and North America, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe is the world's largest regional security organization. The OSCE is an inclusive forum for dialogue on security issues and a platform for joint action to improve the lives of individuals and communities throughout the OSCE area. The OSCE's approach to security is comprehensive and its engagement covers many relevant areas, from hard security issues such as con like conflict and arms control. And so Lavrov is going to visit the OSCE. It's making a mockery of the OSCE. And I've come to think that they're saying things supporting the UN in order to make a mockery of the UN. And I think that's the same kind of thing right now. This is just my perception. Tell me if I'm wrong. You can put it in the comments below. The Maltese Embassy confirmed that the decision to hold the OSCE Ministerial Council meeting on the island applies to all members, including the Russian Federation. But official invitations to the summit, participants have not yet been sent out. Lavrov has been under EU personal sanctions since February of 2022. He's banned from entering any EU countries. Malta has also closed its airspace to Russian uh, flights since February of 2022. In the fall of 2022, Lavrov was not allowed to travel to Poland for the OSCE Council of Foreign Ministers. In 2023, he managed to attend the meeting as it was held in northern Macedonia. And so, again, to my mind, they go to the, these things and they say that they support these things in order to destroy it by through cynicism. I, I don't know how to describe it better than that. 
Okay, next story. Russian forces reprogram Ukrainian mobile and internet equipment in occupied territories. So what are they doing here? This is Euromaidan Press. Well, currently the Russians are attempting to track every instance of Ukrainian citizens using internet resources or mes messaging apps banned by occupation authorities, sometimes blocking entire districts to identify such users. Quote, there are cases where, after blocking entire districts, when someone accesses a social network, they simply arrest everyone, imprison them, and then try to determine who accessed the internet, what information was transmitted, or what was received. Another quote, when the occupiers seized these territories, they simply stole the equipment, reprogrammed it, and now use it as their own. All this is done to maintain control and surveillance over the residents of occupied areas. Now, I don't know how they can keep this up. If Let's say the, the Russians were successful. They would have to have a huge military and security apparatus just to keep the population down. And I don't think that's going to work out so well. Okay, switching gears to the last big story, we're looking at Kamala Harris and Trump. The polls yesterday were real clear politics. Averages were leaning toward Trump. Now, this is a CNN poll, and this is of those who say they've already voted, and it leans very heavily Kamala to Trump in, Mis in Michigan, in Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. But Early voters tend to lean heavily toward the Democrats. The Democrats tend to do early voting. Republicans tend to wait longer until Election Day. But here, Marist has released its final polls for Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Harris up, Harris up, and Harris up. And if we look at their website, this is the Marist polls. You see Harris over Trump in Michigan. You see Harris over Trump in Wisconsin. You see Trump over Harris in North Carolina. We see Trump over Harris in Arizona, and we see essentially a tie in Georgia. It's, it's just too close to call, and anybody who's already called it is full of nonsense. They can't really know at this point. Okay, meanwhile, it seems almost like Trump is trying to destroy himself, but the things that he says actually light up his base more, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. After the garbage comment that got a lot of play, here Trump is now saying, quote, these people are saying I'm a friend of Russia, that I work for Russia, that I'm a Russian spy. They're sick. So he's calling people on the other side, not just the candidate, but people that are talking about him sick. Now, this was in the conversation with Tucker Carlson, and he goes on and he says, Russia's biggest project is Nord Stream 2. It's the largest pipeline of its kind in the world, going from Russia to Germany and then across Europe. I destroyed it. Nobody else did, but I did. I stopped it. So he's running a victory lab for keeping Russia uh, Nord Stream 2 from coming online. Now, he's in this interview with Tucker Carlson. I just want you to hear, uh, it's only 30 seconds or so, but now just hear how he's describing uh, both Adam Schiff and the Democrats writ large. To break the country. It could be they hate our country. I mean, they may hate our country. And we deal with real scum. I mean, like a guy like Adam, Adam Shifty Schiff. He's a sleazebag. And he's probably going to be a senator, if you can believe it. But I call him Watermelon Head. He has the... No, now, he's now, now notice, like, I, I'm frustrated because this is not presidential kind of language, and and I, I feel embarrassed as a Republican about that. Uh, but the audience, the MAGA crowd that he's talking to is cheering in the background. Listen next time he gives an insult, and you'll hear the cheering. If both inside and out. That is... No, but this is a really bad guy. This is a dishonest guy. Not a dumb guy at all. Uh, he's got the smallest neck I've ever seen on a human being. It's true. Hear the cheering? He's a football player, I can tell you. But he's a smart guy, but he's a, uh, he's just a sleazebag. You know, there's nothing else he can, I'll give you a shot to break. The okay, so I, what Trump is doing, this is a feature, not a bug. And you, if you understand that, it makes sense why he does what he does. Okay. Gary Kasparov says Orban endorses Trump, who wants to be Orban, who wants to be Putin. I remember when it would have been bad to have autocrats for, and dictators as friends and allies of the U.S. candidate for president. Yeah, I remember too. I'm a Reagan Republican. Finally, Darth Putin, you see, we're the real victims in this. The people invading, we're the victims. And he's replying to this guy saying uh, the Ukrainian army is proudly bombing every single Ukrainian building that has, Rus has Russian soldiers in it. Yep, you see, we're the real victims in all of this. Okay, one last thing. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be doing a live stream, 9 a.m., 
Eastern Standard Time. Ask me anything. If you are a member or patron, I just want to say thanks. And by being a member and patron, I kind of keep the trolls out. So uh, members and patrons, 9 a.m., ask me anything about the election or anything going on in Ukraine. I'll see you then. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.